Well, the Vinaka, this is Pacific Waves from RNZ Pacific. I'm Elisha Fern. Coming up. Engaging in coups can actually come back to haunt you. And this is what's happened here. But Marama's own political career, that's probably the end of it. Fiji's former Prime Minister Frank Bunny Marama is sentenced to prison. Also, sailing meets science in a new Pacific data gathering project. And. We know that the leading cause of a climate crisis is the burning of fossil fuels. A new climate change documentary examines the impact of mega coal mines in Australia. Fiji's former coup leader and former Prime Minister Frank Bunimarama has been sentenced to one year in prison. Bunimarama was previously found guilty of perverting the course of justice in relation to a police investigation at the University of the South Pacific. Suspended police commissioner Sitiveni Ngilio was also sentenced to two years in prison after previously being found guilty of abuse of office related to the same case. The pair walked out of the High Court in Suva on Thursday in handcuffs and were escorted straight into a police vehicle. I spoke with Fijian academic Stephen Ratuva about the historic sentencing. It's significant because uh, for the Fiji First Party, it might signal the weakening of its power going into the future. Uh, and secondly, it's probably significant as well in terms of giving out the message that coups do not work. Uh, in the long run, and, and the consequences of, uh, of coups could uh, impact on uh, those who uh, carry them out. And, um, and thirdly, it shows that Fiji politics is very, very dynamic, and those in power, those who wield power, uh, at some point, the law can be um, used against them. So, uh, yeah, significant in three, in three ways. Bani Marama had 30% of the eligible population vote. He led for 16 years and now will not be able to run for office for eight years. This is historic, isn't it? It is historic because uh, he won't be able to run the next election, which means that uh, he won't be able to um, mobilise the massive number of votes that managed to get the Fiji First into power. It's significant because uh, for the Fiji First Party, it might signal uh, the weakening of its power going into the future. So the Fiji First Party will have to look for someone else to be able to generate that much vote. So a lot of those votes will probably go to the other political parties, and, uh, which means that it's a win and a loss to the Fiji First. And what, what do his supporters make of all of this? Uh, what, how will they be responding? Well, I'm sure that the supporters won't be very happy with it. Uh, some have moved on, and I think the, uh, um, the very close supporters are uh, probably not going to be very happy. We'll still see what may happen. Hopefully, nothing dramatic will happen in terms of uh, um, some of the manifestations, some of those dissatisfactions arising out of uh, what has happened. So hopefully, there will be uh, peace and quiet in the country. And Bani Marama's legal team indicated it will appeal after its attempt to have the former Prime Minister receive bail, but that was rejected by the High Court. So what now? Well, he's probably go, going for, for bail. Uh, that's uh, to be uh, expected. And uh, uh, and I think it uh, uh, depends very much on the process in the court. And that will make a final decision on the, on the appeal, uh, whether it's going to work or not in this particular case. And Sitibini uh, Ingelio was also sentenced for two years in prison. Uh, was this a surprise? And, and what does this mean, I guess, um, for the, the wider picture of setting a precedent of bad behaviour? Yeah, Gilio has got two years, and Bani Marama one year, based on a number of uh, issues, I suppose, to do with health and, and so forth. And uh, again, um, it sends out a message that uh, engaging in coups, uh, which uh, probably would be beneficial in the short term, can actually come back to haunt you. And this is what's happened here. Bani Marama's own political career, that's probably the end of it. So the, the laws which uh, were once um, abrogated, uh, will still be there, and um, and ha- they have the potential to um, get back at you. So there are a number of lessons which can be learned from what has happened. And some people would argue, is this a, a true comeback of democracy in Fiji? Yes, it can be seen as uh, the normalisation of democracy, because um, the, the, the coups are illegal and undemocratic, and the fact that the courts have spoken means that the process of uh, the judicial process is still in place. Uh, what has happened in terms of the, uh, the role of the chief justice, but uh, the system itself has been uh, 
functional to the extent that it has made a decision for for the uh, jail camps. In some ways, it has to do with uh, well the way in which the uh, democracy itself, in the context of uh, judiciary, can be seen to be uh, uh, kind of working. A new project aims to close the existing gap on Pacific Ocean data. New Zealand Geographic and Cawthron Institute have launched Citizens of the Sea, aiming to map the health and biodiversity of the Pacific at a larger scale than before. The project partners with sailors who gather the data and return it for analysis. A flotilla of boats was set to leave New Zealand's Bay of Islands on Thursday for the Pacific Rally, with the science tools on board. Christina Perseco spoke with Xavier Porchon, who is part of Cawthron's Institute's biosecurity group. There's three types of data that we are collecting effectively in the program. Uh, there is environmental DNA, uh, or eDNA for short. The other set of data is uh, biophysical sensors data, such as you know temperature or water depth that each boat are equipped with. And the third component is a 3D reconstruction of coral reefs. Uh, and this is using cutting edge photogrammetry. The eDNA in particular, this is my space, this is what I've been uh, working on for more than a decade now, is um, refers to all of the DNA traces or the genetic material that is left behind uh, organisms in their milieu. We now have the, the capacity, the ability to capture this eDNA from a few liters of seawater, and we can concentrate it back in the lab. We can then uh, read it using DNA sequencing uh, in a process that's called metabarcoding. Uh, so a little bit like uh, when you go to the supermarket and you, uh, you scan your spaghetti or other items. And that allows you to visualize and create uh, a full catalog of marine life that is found in any particular sample. Therefore, this is a, a really, really powerful technology uh, because it can be harnessed uh, you know, to track biodiversity shifts uh, in response to climate change, for example. It can identify uh, conservation hotspots or also to the reverse. It can identify the regions that are more stressed uh, by the changing climate or by uh, pollution gradients uh, in coastal areas. Uh, and it can also uh, monitor the health of our ocean. It sounds to me as a, as a layperson that this info could be very useful for people who live in the Pacific. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. So the, the beauty of these tools is that they're really user-friendly. These could be distributed relatively easily to, uh, to communities in the Pacific, and it's certainly something we aim for uh, as we move uh, in, in the program. You spoke briefly about uh, biophysical sensors and um, testing water temperature. Is that going to feed into data about climate change? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so that's a really good question because those biophysical sensors are essential for uh, combining with the eDNA analysis. So the eDNA will give you the biological layer of what's going on in the surface ocean samples, uh, you know, understanding the food webs, uh, how organisms interact, who eats what, uh, and then if you add on to that the, uh, the knowledge on uh, temperature profiles through the water column, the water depth, and, and in the future we will uh, develop very actively uh, other portable sensors like temperature, uh, sea surface um, temperature, obviously, but also salinity, uh, or dissolved oxygen, uh, pH. What impact do you hope that this program will have on communities who live on Pacific Islands? Certainly, we hope that this effort will aid communities in the Pacific in a big way. Um, obviously, we talked about it before. Uh, there's a huge data gap in the Pacific. And it's incredibly uh, important for uh, island nations to understand the state of their biodiversity and, and health. If you look no further than what's happening right now on coral reefs, it's really quite heartbreaking to just uh, have heard last week, uh, as a matter of fact, that we're experiencing the fourth global uh, bleaching uh, event. Coral reefs are essential for island nations up there to protect the coastlines, to maintain a rich and biodiverse habitat that brings fish and that people feed on them, etc., etc. So it's, it's really essential that we, 
we get a much better understanding of the health status of this ecosystem. And this is something we could do uh, by combining the eDNA analysis over these reefs and the coral reef photogrammetry, which is the, the third component of the program, uh, which is uh, essential uh, in this avenue. Is there anything else you would like to add? I would just like to say that um, in terms of community engagement on island nations in the tropics, this is really something that's at, uh, at the heart of the project. Uh, we have, uh, we're starting this process right now, but with key scientists, that are um, placed in these different islands that work directly with the program. So we've got uh, people uh, in, in Tonga, um, like Karen Stone at the uh, Vavau Environmental Protection Association. We've got Victor Bonito, who is the director of Reef Explorer Fiji, doing amazing work with communities and schools in Fiji, bringing them over reefs and uh, farming corals and increasing the ocean literacy with everyone. And then we also have uh, some colleagues, of course, in uh, New Caledonia at uh, CNRS and University of New Caledonia who are directly in, uh, involved in this project. So what we hope to do is to uh, push the science, but also um, as we advance, have dedicated workshops with not only the sailors that are collecting the data, we will analyze their data as soon as uh, they arrive in Tonga and Fiji. And we commit in about three to four weeks to get all of the uh, genetic sequences back to them and we'll meet them in Fiji for a dedicated workshop in September 5th. We want to share this data in a way that they can understand with very fun and interactive web app that we're developing right now where they can explore their own data. And we will take this opportunity to bring local communities to the table, uh, including local schools and uh, local stakeholders, ministries, so that we can get uh, really a nice exchange of knowledge, both traditional and modern knowledge. A new climate change documentary, Walanba Niani, Stronger Together, follows a crew of Pacific climate activists and Australian school students visiting the lands of the Gomori people in New South Wales. It's here they explore the impact of Australian mega coal mines on the environment. Managing Director of the climate change charity 350.org and documentary organiser Joseph Sikulu told Caleb Fotheringham why stories are one of the most powerful ways to advocate for climate action. The story we wanted to tell is we know that the leading cause of a climate crisis is the burning of fossil fuels. And uh, if we were to draw a line from where fossil fuels are extracted to the point where we feel their impacts on the front lines of the climate crisis, along the entirety of that line, you will see a whole lot of destruction. But you will also see all of the communities who are standing up in resistance and resilience. And that's what this film is about. It's about connecting those communities from the point of extraction of fossil fuels to the point of impact in the Pacific. And so we're connecting communities in Australia, in northern New South Wales, of the Gomorrah and the Gumilaroi people who have been fighting fracking and coal mining for decades and decades. Also the farmers who live there who don't want any of this mining to happen on their country. People who have really thought through about what a transition for their communities looks like uh, we've also connected within the South Asian communities who are standing up for their communities where fossil fuels are being shipped from Australia and are continue to be used to divide and oppress people. Also, when there are school strikers who understand the gravity of the moment and throughout the pressure they feel and the anxiety they feel are organising to turn people out to make change. And then those of us in the Pacific who are really feeling the impacts now and are doing everything we can in our region and globally to fight it. So it's a documentary about connecting all of the communities who are fighting this resistance to tell a, a bigger, bigger story around uh, what that looks like globally. That sounds like a lot in a 35-minute film. It's really about just the experiences of our stories, and it's told through the lens of our young people and how they're feeling these moments. For some of them, it's their first time experiencing an action, and I think that's the important thing that people need to connect with is the reasons why people are doing this and where they're coming from. And those are what you can tell within that time span. And also just seeing, connecting with the visuals of what we're trying to achieve. All of these things can pour out within any amount of time you give people. It's really about that connection. And what makes this film different to other climate change documentaries out there? Uh, this wasn't really planned. It was one of those things, like I said before, for us it's important to document things for posterity. It's important for us to record things as we're experiencing them. 
And that's what makes this, I think, different from other films is that we were documenting as we went. It really is about this action, about what our young people are trying to do in order to build resilience and about connecting these communities. And that's not a story that is told often. It's like this story of connecting extraction to impact isn't something that we talk about. So Australia has the bid in for COP31 in 2026. How do you feel like that aligns with what you saw when the documentary was getting made? The documentary was actually made right before COP28, so just before we went over to Dubai. And one of the features within the documentary is actually an art piece of Power Up artwork, and it was created in Fiji, transported into uh, Gomorrah country, and then taken to Dubai during COP, where we wanted to pour our vision for what the future was into an artwork. And so we used it in an action, and then it's, it was a bit of a jigsaw piece, so it's been divided and it's spread all over the world. And so conversations around COP and Australia's bid were already happening around then. And this, the hard thing about COPs at the moment is that logistically it's already difficult for our region to get there. Every year it's expensive. Every year our governments and negotiators have to travel so far. By the time they get there, they're tired and then they're up for such long periods of time to try and negotiate everything for our survival. So having COP in our region will mean that our region can take part in the process in a way that they've not done in, in forever. And it's an opportunity for us to be able to push Australia's leadership on climate. It's an opportunity for us to showcase the leadership of the Pacific. It's an opportunity for us to bring our communities into to the climate negotiations process in such a huge way. And so I, I'm one of those who hopes that Australia does secure their bid, but my hope is that in securing that bid, they really do work well with our leaders to ensure that it's a, both Australia and a Pacific COP and also include Indigenous and First Nations people right from the get-go as well. So what do you think about the criticism with Australia's bid, with people saying that with all the fossil fuel operations going on in Australia, they really shouldn't have a bid in COP? This is one of the, the reasons why we want to showcase the documentary in the way that we are at the moment, with, with it being an opportunity to organise people, because we have to. Social movements need to get up right now and demand that the Australian government even before they secure this bid, are doing so and showing leadership by, first and foremost, ending the extraction of fossil fuels. And that's the job that's ahead of us. The other thing we also have to remember is that there's not going to be an opportunity that our region is going to have, again, to be able to take leadership and to shape the agenda. And so we have to make best of whatever opportunities we're given. That's Pacific Waves for today. To listen back, head over to rnzi.com slash programs. We're also on Spotify, Apple and iHeartRadio. From myself and the RNZ Pacific team, Tofa Soifua.